Hello friends, uh, today this is our 10th lecture on uh, self-reflectiveness and apology for poetry. And in this lecture, the main point is, the, what I have written here, the laurel crown should be kept upon the poets, not laurel crown of victory, should be kept upon the head of the poets and not on historian or the philosopher. This is the argument today. Now he says, there are some people who praise history. And they praise history because they say, in history you got the facts. And these facts are, for self this is, they are foolish facts of the world. But at the same time, those who praise history, they say, in history, the wicked are punished and the virtues are rewarded. Virtue is rewarded and wickedness punished in history. But this is not the case in poetry, some people say. But according to Sir Philip Sidney, it is not at all true. Because in poetry, do you know you have got a concept called poetic justice? What is poetic justice means? And this poetic justice is handled by the poets. The poet has a freedom. Poetic justice means virtue is rewarded and the uh, wicked are punished. That is, as you can see in the other law, virtuous people are rewarded and uh, at the end the yago is taken out as a miserable fellow. And this is the case with all the wicked people, as you can see in uh, dramas or in poems and so on. Now therefore it is in, in poetry you have got poetic justice. In History, you have got the foolish facts of the world. See? And some people will say in history, in poetry, you can see that the virtuous, the virtue is glorified in poetry. And virtue is always accompanied by fortune, good fortune. Therefore, people will be attracted towards virtue and they will be prompted to embrace virtue and virtuous action. Now, if you go through history, you will find, say Ulysses, for example, he suffers hardships. Sometimes you, are, you can see him in the midst of a storm. This, uh, Sir Philip Sidney says, it's not because he is a wicked person. It is uh, giving him a training, a kind of formation of the character, so that when he shines in prosperity, he will be magnanimous, he will be very generous, and he will be very just. Now, if you take uh, the, the, some characters in history, you have got, for example, the valiant uh, Miltiades. 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 Miltiades was a valiant uh, Athenian uh, who fought in the Battle of Marathon. He was virtuous, he was very valiant, he fought. Uh, ready to sacrifice his life, he fought in the Battle of Marathon. But what happened to him in history? In history, he died in... He actually is not right. He was, he, was, uh, he was left to rot in his chains or in fetish. Fetish means chains. So the valiant Miltiades in history, but if it were in poetry, definitely the poet would have made some alterations to project the virtue or the, the, the courage of this great uh, fighter. Understand? This great, this great uh, Athenian. But what happened in history? History, the foolish fact of history is given as such. You can see the very first example. You have got a half dozen examples given by Sir Philip uh, Sidney. The first one is Valiant Miltiades. Although he was valiant, he courageous, he fought, threw himself into the battle, soul and the body, but finally what happened to him, he is rooting in the chains. Understand? Then you can see uh, Socrates. Socrates, what happened? Accomplished Socrates. Socrates was accomplished. Accomplished world in all respects. Supposed to be the greatest philosopher the world has had ever seen. What happened to him? He was treated as a traitor. He was poisoned to death. Same is with the Phocion. 
for Shion. That is another Greek uh, statesman. What happened is the same thing happened to him also, as it happened to Socrates. Just as Socrates was poisoned to death, so to Phocion was poisoned to death. Same fate, that is. He was a very famous and very able a statesman of Athens. So you can see in history, the first those who praise history, they say that virtue is rewarded in history and wicked are punished. But look at this now. Miltiades, the valiant. Socrates, the most accomplished. For sure, again another uh, statesman, very able. What happened to him? He was punished. He was, he was given poison and he died like a Socrates. Listen. And then you have got the, already three persons I have given you. You have got the, in Roman history, you have Sulla and Marius. Sulla and Marius. Marius. What happened to these people? They are valiant people. They are statesmen, they are Roman generals, so to say. Sulla and uh, Marius, they were Roman generals. And what happened to them? They were left to die in their beds with nobody to attend to them. See? Roman generals. But what did their end? Their end is tragic. And another character is, you can see, the virtuous Cato, who wrote, who wrote the history of Rome in Latin. This is the first history of Rome written in Latin. What happened to him? He was driven to suicide. The circumstances created in such a way that he killed himself. See that? What happened to him? Then you can see in history, Caesar remained victorious. Caesar and Pompey were equals. But then what happened is that uh, Caesar managed to uh, create situations in such a way, plotting and scheming. He killed, he, he saw that his rival Pompey was finished. This is what happened. And who was Pompey? Statesman, statesman, and uh, equal to Caesar. And what about uh, Caesar? So Pompey, boom. And you take examples from Roman history, Cicero. And Cicero also is the same. Great orator. He was a great orator. See? And then a statesman. Was an orator and statesman. What happened to him? They were also slain. Murdered in cold blood. This is what happened. So, virtuous people, great people, what happened to them in history? This is the thing. And rebel Caesar, I told you, victorious. For years he ruled, uh, he ruled as a dictator of Rome. This is what happened to, in history, this is what has happened. So this is a foolish uh, truth of the world according to, according to uh, self university So we began saying that in history it is virtue rewarded and, uh, and uh, wicked punished. Here what happens, you can see. You took an array of leaders, philosophers, statesmen, accomplished people, like uh, Socrates, what happened to them? All of them met with a tragic death. Either they were slain, or they were left to rot in their beds, or they were left, they were, uh, they were chased and they were killed, like that of Pombe, in the case of Pombe, and uh, uh, the, uh, you get the dictator Caesar, he flourished in Rome. Think of that. Where, where will you find this in history? But suppose the same thing could be presented by a poet. He, will, he has got the, he has, he is free to make, uh, frame things according to the, uh, according to his will and pressure in such a way that these stories, when you read, we will get pressure and at the same time we will be able to get something to carry with us, that is, to reform our character and our outlook on life. There is a three, four very cruel people. He gives the example of four very cruel people. They are all, for example, Caipselos. Caipselos, that is one. 
Caipsalos is one, second one is periander, periander, periander. And the third is, he gives the example of phalaris, phalaris, phalaris. Now all the three were tyrants, tyrants. And this is first tyrant of Corinth. This is the second tyrant of Corinth. And this is the tyrant of Akragas, Akragas. Akragas, that is today in Sicily. Sicily, in Sicily. The tyrant, they flourished. See? Then there was another Dionysius. Dionysius. He was a judge. He was a judge in Athens. And but of course later on he was converted when he came across the the preachings of Saint Paul and also the teachings and preachings of Saint Paul. But to begin with he was a bad person. Or he was a wicked person. Understood? And you have got the other examples from Rome. I hope it is clear. Caipsalos, first tyrant of tyrant of Oren. Periander, second tyrant of Corinth, and Phalaris, tyrant of Akragos, that is now said as in Sicily, and Dionysius, the judge, Athens. But later, of course, he was, he was, uh, he changed this, uh, cannot say conversion, but some changes took place in him, because he listened to, uh, he listened to, he was, he was enamored of or attracted by the teachings of, teachings of uh, St. Paul. Understand? Now you can see Septimus Severus, he's a very cruel cool emperor. But he was prosperous. When he, when um, Caesar ordered the assassination of Sulla, uh, Sulla, we have already seen, he is there. Uh, a, a general, sorry, a general, a statesman. So, like I said, literas neshivit, neshivit. He said, that is the reason he said, we are, we are all right. Literas neshivit. That means, he does not know the literature, and therefore, <laughs> we are going to kill him. So, he, some kind of protects, excuse me. Caesar wanted to get rid of him. Then he said, finish him off. Because he does not know literature. In that case, how many people will die? Because they don't know literature. Isn't it? So this is the situation. That means, he was playing with the fate of these people. Playing with the fate of all those who, whom he thought would be a rival to him. And rebel Caesar, he lived for a very long period of time, as you can see in Roman history, he was the he was the unquestioned dictator of Rome. Finally, of course, he had a very tragic end. That's, a, that's another thing. But for life, for a very long period of time, he was there. Understand? So he says, poet except history and philosophy. Poesy and poet. He excelled, that is a quote from this essay, he excelled history and philosophy. That is what uh, uh, he says. So, poetry teaches in such a way that you will embrace virtue. That's what he said. So, so the, uh, he concludes like this in this section. Section of course is made by us to make it easy for you to understand things. That's why point by point I am taking. Today's point is that the laurel of, the crown of victory, the laurel of, laurel crown of victory should be, uh, should be on the head of the poet and not on the historian and the philosopher. So we saw already in the historian is tied, so to say. He is limited by the foolish truth of the world. But on the other hand, the poet is free. He has got some liberty. 
And a second reason that we saw is so that he can convert these things into teaching points, and so that the people will, uh, the people will be encouraged to embrace virtue. But on the other hand, we can see history as such: all the wicked people prosper, and all the virtuous people they met with a tragic end. Number of them we saw in Greek, Greek history of Greece. And history of Rome is. Septimus Severus, Severus, the cruel emperor, he, was, he flourished. Caesar flourished for a lo very long period in the history of uh, Rome. Therefore, it says, in poetry, excellent. Excellent is old from excellent. Poetry excellent. And he concludes in this section like this the indeed said, indeed. He says, indeed, Satat, Satat means set, Satat, that is the, uh, the old form, Satat. The laurel crown upon the poet, indeed Satat, the laurel crown, laurel crown upon, upon the poet. Indeed Satat, you can take this down, this is a very good quotation, as victorious not only of the historian, but over the philosopher. Poet as victorious, not only, not only of the history, poet as victorious, not only of the historian, of the historian, but over, but over the philosopher. So this is the conclusion today. Today's conclusion is this. So the poet stands above these two categories of people, historians and also philosophers. Why philosophers in detail we will see tomorrow, but or the next class. But he says that poetry, for the time being, just one more point, that is poetry is much greater than philosophy. People will say that philosophy is methodical in teaching, but philosophy cannot move you. Philosophy will not make any movement in your mind or any, it won't affect you, but poetry will affect you. Poetry will move you. Remember Lanzanus just transport you. And only by moving you a person, only a movie that you can change your character. Only by moving, you can put your gnosis into praxis. Gnosis. Gnosis means knowing. Gnosis, Aristotle says, gnosis into practice. Practice. The ending end of all arts and knowledge we have already seen what? Virtuous action. Only the poet and his poetry can move you to virtuous action. All the other knowledge remains in the, in the realm of concepts, ideas and abstractions, especially in philosophy. Defines and defines and tells you uh, a truck lot of ideas. But how do you put this into action if you are not moved. So this moving, the spirit, that can be done only by a poet. See that there is nobody, even Aristotle says so, there is no person like Philo, Philo, Philosophos, Philosophos, Phil, see, Philo, Philosopher, Philo means love. Philo again love. This is wisdom. So there is no person in the world who is just because of the love of wisdom will act according to the precepts of philosophy. There is nobody in this world who has fallen in love with or there is no instance in this world, this is what Aristotle says, 
There's nobody like who falls in love with philosophy and then moved by philosophy and then put those things in action. This movement or moved by something can only be done by a poet. Understand? Therefore, see this. Indeed, set the laurel crown upon the poet as victorious, not only of the historian. We have seen he has won his, the poet has won WN, won his final triumph over the historian by arguing that in history the wicked prosper and the uh, uh, virtuous are punished. By, on the other hand, according to the principles of poetic justice in poetry, the wicked are punished and the virtuous they are rewarded. So we have argued in such a way, not we, but uh, as we always say, Sir Philip Sidney has argued in such a way that there is no doubt, there is no space, no scope for uh, any doubt that the poet is superior to the historian. Now as a tip of an iceberg, you can see for today, you will find he says about our philosopher, our, but all the philosopher also. Because if there is a royal, a, a laurel crown of victory, who deserves it? You should give it to the poet. And uh, Aristotle himself says, there is nobody in the world who is philo philosophers. He has fallen in love with philosophy and learned philosophy now. Or moved by philosophy. Only the poet can do that. Only by moving a person's mind, by, ch by slightly changing the mind of a person, movements change. You can only put what you learn into practice. That is, the journey from gnosis to praxis, it can be done only by a poet. And therefore, he is much superior to philosopher also. More of this argument we will see in the next class. For the time being, I think it is clear to you that the philosopher and the historian, they remain behind, you can say, the poets. When you, have got a, when you have got a march of great men, say so philosophers, then who will hold the, who, who, will, who, who will be uh, uh, in the vanguard, that means front, from, uh, in front of the procession, front of the procession, that will be the poet. Understand? He will be in front of the uh, procession, not the philosopher, not the historian. For reasons we have already stated. And finally, once again I will repeat this, this is you can take down also, if you feel like that is when examinations and so on and so on. So, if you can quote these such sentences, your answer will be as uh, Bacon says, studies serve for delight for ornaments and for ability. Studies serve for ornaments, that is this. When you are speaking you can quote, when you are writing your exams you can quote. That is an ornament to your answer. So once again, we'll see. Indeed, set the laurel crown upon the poet as victorious, not only of the historian, but over the philosophies. So my dear friends, I hope you are following my lectures and you are enjoying. And with this optimistic note, we will today say goodbye to each other. I am okay. You are also okay. And so, take things easy. Take care.